How's it going, YouTube world? Carpo here. I just made a video a little earlier about getting shit done and uh, getting motivated, and so I proceeded to go in and force myself to be motivated. Cleaned up around the house and got some stuff done, and then uh, I decided to put on my lab coat here, and uh, I kind of ripped it on a doorknob, so I got out my sewing machine and I sewed it up, and uh, it got me thinking about just kind of doing things on your own, you know, and, and how we we have all these you know all these materials available that we can make our own clothes but it's so much cheaper don't just to buy them uh, but anyway that's not the subject I was going to talk about I something totally different actually which was music and uh, just the <laughs> the perspective that we have growing up about what music me what songs mean the meaning of songs now anybody who's growing up anybody who's say under the age of 30 probably won't be able to relate to this at all but if you're, say, 40 or older, uh, if you grew up in anywhere up, up through the, say, 80s or even the 90s, you'll remember the, the days before the internet, when a song would come out, everybody would spread these rumors about what they meant. And these days, they're easily dispelled because of the internet. But back, back in the 80s, when a song came out and somebody said it was about something, uh, you know, we we just believed people. There were so many rumors. I mean, it wasn't just music. It was like drugs, like uh, jokes about, you know, like if you if you take acid seven times, you're legally insane. Things like that. And you couldn't confirm it. You know, there's no manual you can look up or go on the net and look at the health website or anything like that. So we were pretty damn stupid. <laughs> and uh, it's just the reason why I thought about this was because while I was in there cleaning up, I popped on the Beatles. Now I grabbed two Beatles albums. I grabbed the, uh, what was it, like the, the 68 to 70, 74 or something, and the 70, or what was it, no. Anyway, whatever, there's like the 62 to 68 and the 68 to 70 or something like that. And there are two double LP sets, you know, and I listened to the first one, of course, then the second one, and as I was listening, of course, various songs came on that had some of these rumors with them. And one of them was, a, I should just do the obvious one first, which is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Now, growing up the entire time, we were convinced that song was about LSD. And, of course, later we learned and read it that, you know, Paul had said that the song, actually, it was um, not Paul, but, um, was it Paul's son? One of their sons came in, uh, or no, it was, it was John Lennon's son, it was Julian Lennon, I believe, and came home from school, and he had a little drawing of a, a picture. He said, what is it? And he said, it's Lucy in, in the sky, and she has, and there's diamonds. And you can look at the picture online to see it, you know, there's Lucy in the sky, and there's diamonds. However, only in recent years, I guess, in an interview, they said that uh, apparently... He said, he says, it's pretty obvious that the song's about, about a trip. So I have to, I have to look more into that, see if it's true, but my, my conclusion is that the, that the song originally, it just happened to be LSD in the coinc and so there was kind of a, maybe a little tie into both of them. The song is too crazy to not be about psychedelics, so it makes it hardy, even if they're telling you that it's not. You're like, then what the hell is it about? You know, why did this picture inspire this idea of Alice in Wonderland, and, and, you know, but could very well be 100% coincidence and absolutely have nothing to do with LSD. So I should get to the to the one that actually inspired me to make this video. Um, and this was Strawberry Fields Forever. Now in the 80s, we were told there, that Strawberry Fields Forever, I, I remember somebody saying, you know what Strawberry Fields are, right? And I said, no. It's like, you know, tracks, you know, from Slam and Dope. No, it looks like the little spots on a strawberry totally made sense to me. And you listen to the song, Living is easy with eyes closed, misunderstanding all you see. It's getting hard to be someone, but it all works out. It doesn't matter much to me or what. You know, I can't, it's, it's just such an obvious heroin song, but it's not, apparently. And now I should just back up a little bit and say that there is a possibility that that could have been implied in the song, but there's no information I can find about that. So if anybody else has info, to, you know, to show that, uh, maybe I'm wrong. But anything you want to get out of a song, whatever you want to make out of it, it it's it's. This is what what what's really been important to me is making a song work for you. Even a one-line song, like a fish song. Uh, one of my favorite songs is called "Divided Sky." The only line in the song is "Divided Sky, the wind blows high." 
and it's like a 10 minute jam, you know, but I have a pin of, you know, that says divided sky and everything, because that means something to me, that line, and everybody has their own opinions on what things mean, so I guess to, to make a point, what does it really matter what a song means to the person who wrote it? What's more important, the feeling you get from it, the feeling you get from it, or, you know, for example, there's some songs that are kind of obvious, like, I was thinking of one, Gold Dust Woman from Fleetwood Mac. Um, I guess Fleetwood, you know, <laughs> back in the day they were doing a lot of blow, and uh, who wasn't in the 80s? You know, it was huge. But a lot of songs were about cocaine, about heroin, about psychedelics, um, all the way from the 60s through today. Uh, as for some of them becoming much more obvious, and this is, this is why the old ones were a little... Um, there were so many rumors about them because everyone was having to encode what they wanted to say in a metaphor just like Led Zeppelin you know squeeze my lemon till the juice runs down my leg well it's obvious he's not making lemonade um, you know there are, there are some implications of sexual drug wise reference and otherwise I think that we could just kind of take what we want out of it so take music and religion and put them together and say the same thing you take what works for you out of it, you can take your own meaning out of it, and walk away with something that betters you and makes you happier. To me, can music is my connection to my world. Uh, I should say, maybe not my world, you know, going out in the woods is my connection to the world, but it's my connection, music is my connection to my emotions. It's my way of pulling out anger, pulling out happiness, pulling out elation. I've noticed if I wake up in the morning and I'm just feeling just, you know, average and I pop on a record, and yes, I play records, uh, I just love the sound of warm vinyl, it's just instantly I'm dancing and moving. If, if I'm ever in a depressed mood, you can pop a Valium if you're really anxious, or you can put on some music and get the exact same feeling because whether it's the frequency, the notes, the vibrations, or the meaning behind the music, um, whatever works is the point, whatever makes you feel good. Which is interesting here because you pull out a music that you know and that you know well and of course it's going to bring up emotions of that music. Uh, but sometimes you can put on music that you don't even know and can you get out, can you get the same emotion out of some of that music? Now I can but only if it's from somebody I know. For example, if I were to put on a brand new Fish album that came out, I would instantly enjoy it because it's Fish, and I like the band, and because I know the notes. If I were to hear a live Grateful Dead show, it wouldn't matter what Dead show it was. Hearing that live, you know, Jerry on the fretboard there is just, it just, oh, it's like, it's like, oh man, it's like candy for the ears, you know. But other people listen to it, and it's just the Grateful Dead to them. It's just, oh, those guys, you know, they suck. To me, the Grateful Dead were the greatest band of all time. The greatest rock band of all time by far. And I don't really think many people can dispute that. Whether you like the Grateful Dead or not, they were the band. I mean, 50 years. And of course, after Jerry died, you know, it was more like, it was more like 30 years, but they still toured and, you know, they're still playing music and they still do great. But they did it for the right reasons and for the love. And I'm going to just kind of go off subject here and say that one thing I loved about the Grateful Dead and, and a lot of people don't know is that <clears throat> when they started in the mid-60s, you know, back before then they were known as the Warlocks down in San Fran and eventually changed the name to the Grateful Dead. During that time the acid tests were going on and uh, it was Ken Kesey, I believe, who uh, said, hey, I tried this new, you know, substance called LSD and he, uh, he told Jerry and Mountain Girl about it. And then Jerry and Mountain Girl ended up coming back and, and seeing him one day, and they're like, we got some, and, and, you know, the rest is history. During that time, so many people were taking psychedelics, and there was a huge revolution to, to, from music to use it to express dislike and disdain for the system, for the government. People were speaking about freedom. Well, I gotta tell you, this whole time, Jerry Garcia wore a black t-shirt, and he made it a point to never talk about politics. He didn't sing about politics. They didn't wear any protesting shirts or support anti-war protests or anything. And it's not because they didn't agree with war, it's because they just wanted to, or it's not because they did agree with war, it's because they wanted nothing to do with political movements. They just wanted to play music. 
And I think that that's why I can listen to any show and know that they're there doing it for the love. It was awesome. I'm very grateful, no pun intended, to be able to go see the shows I did. And I fell in love with The Grateful Dead in about 92 and went to like 10 shows between then and 90, or it was like 91 or 92. Watched about, went to about 10 shows, you know, I think it was like six in Eugene and uh, two in Portland, Seattle. I went down to Shoreline in Oakland, and uh, took my, my. I had a Volkswagen bus, you know, drove down there, um, and I didn't even get into the show in Shoreline. I just stood outside and listened to Terrapin Station with tears running down my cheeks. Just, it just. I have never been in such an amazing. An, you can't even put a word to it. Amazed or elated, just don't do justice to the feeling you get from music you truly love when you're crying for love. You're just crying out of just that emotional connection. And to me, that's what life's about. There's not much else that you can take out of life that you can really look back on and say, that was great, um, except for an emotional moment like that. And those are the things we seek. This is why it's not, you know, this is why dulling our emotions using heavy amounts of drugs or opiates, um, you know, can be such a bad thing because we lose not just our happiness but our sadness and our elation as well and, and all these different emotions. And so anytime I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm becoming an emotionless, I, I feel like I'd just become nothing. I'd lose myself. And it's sad because I know people who don't like music or don't listen to music. I'll say, this little story I'll tell you real quick. I worked with a guy. I worked for a guy. Um, there were a couple of uh, gay guys that lived up in the West Hills. One of the guys was younger. He was like the younger guy that he wanted. He still wanted to go out and party. You know, I could tell he wanted to go out and go to dance clubs and stuff. And he was probably in his, you know, he was like 38 or something. And the older guy was like 50 or 50, 52 or something. So he was older. And he was the stable one. And he worked and he owned, worked for this West Coast produce distributor. So he was always in and out. They were remodeling the house and I did all the work for their house for two years on this historic home. You know, building cabinets and custom coffered ceilings and all the trim and molding and crazy seven piece crown molding and stuff. And he'd just have me stand there with different crown moldings. You know, he was very particular about what he, what he liked. And when we were remodeling the house, he put in these speakers. It was really, I can't even remember which, uh, uh, which brand of speakers they were really nice in ceiling speakers like three-way badass you know probably a few hundred bucks each at least um, and he put them all through the whole house and all of it ran to a central stereo system which controlled it it was a really nice like top of the line it was a Denon I think whatever it wasn't the greatest but it was a very expensive stereo system and for the whole second year after it was installed he never played anything but the same symphony CD over and over that he didn't even really listen to or appear to like. He played it when people were coming over to create an ambiance in the house. And I just found it so shallow. Uh, but more than that, it was I felt sorry for him because I asked him about it. I was like, what do you listen to? He's like, man, I never really listen to music. And I come to find out that he grew up traveling with his parents in a Volkswagen bus. His parents were hardcore hippies. And he wants to, nothing to do with that with the music, with the lifestyle, he's super clean and anal now, you know, and it shows what certain people can, like, back away from music because maybe their parents enjoyed it too much, I don't know. Uh, but it really amazed me. And I've talked to several people who are well, you know, who are much older than I, who have never been to a concert, not even like a waterfront blues festival or, or a local bar band or something. Uh, it's, it's something everybody has to do. Even if you don't like the band, find something that you somewhat like and go see it. Because when I go see bands even that I don't know, if they're an opening band or something or I'll try something new, I always have a great time. I've never gone to a concert and not been able to dance and have fun. So that's my rant about music. Kind of started off with meanings of songs, but um, I think a lot of people could probably relate to that. The, the old 80s rumors thing. In fact, Anybody who's made it this far in the video, if you did grow up <clears throat> in any generation, but if you especially grew up in my generation, or even before or after, I guess, what is the what are some of the rumors that you heard <laughs> that 
were spread around, you know, such as the LSD, take it seven times and you're legally insane. No, it was take more than seven hits of LSD and you're legally insane is what it was. Even if you take them over a spread period of time, it's like there's, um, or that, you know, cannabis, uh, you know, does this, or grows boobs, you know, whatever, all the different things we heard. Rumors are funny. It's almost not as fun to be able to dispel them these days, but...